guys, it's, it's so expensive to get buried. Like I told my wife, like, just torch me up. It's fine. <laughs> like, and it doesn't have to be weird. You don't have to put me on a, on a mantle or anything. Just sprinkle me on my Xbox and I'll be fine. What is up, Twister World? We are back. I'm here with my boys, Andy and Cody. What's up, guys? Yo. Yo. So, uh, hey, the uh, poll was done. We appreciate all the participants. Alcatraz was the winner. I know it was a, a, a close race. Um, so we are going to do the Alcatraz episode. Um, we have some plans for it. And uh, so stay tuned. Um, we know that we said it was going to be the next episode, but uh, just get ready. We're going to be doing some things. And uh, so, uh, guys, you know, one, want to give a shout out to all of our, our everybody that's really contributing to our, our, our podcast, our pages, everybody that's listening. Um, we want to uh, just appreciate you guys. You know, we love you guys. We're trying to stay consistent, right? Every week, record something new. Um, some of them hit, some of them don't, but we're we're working on it. And we'll we'll continuously be open to the idea of topics. So if anybody wants to go on and comment topics that we're going to do, and for those topics that didn't win in the poll, which was um, Zodiac and Atlantis, uh, Atlantis. Atlantis. Mm-hmm. we're going to do future podcasts on those as well. Uh, we'll put them into the pool, and they may be a couple of months down the road, but we're definitely going to do some topics on those. But we wanted to give people a chance to go and vote on one we can do in an upcoming episode. So in the next few weeks, we'll drop that that new one. So look out for that. We'll uh, we'll make sure we post in in preparation for that, so people know that the one that they voted on is coming. Yeah, absolutely. So stay tuned. It's going to be a great one. Um, today we are going to talk about five gentlemen who. Have gone missing. Um, I'm gonna um, hand this over to my boy. He's gonna lay it out for us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna be talking about the missing five from Yuba County. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. And Thank you. Back to you. And back to you. Andy with the weather. Andy oh, with the weather. I was sorry. I'm a little news reporter over here. I just said thank you. <laughs> I, it, I'm going to listen back and I'm going to laugh because that's it's what it sounded like a transition on a on a TV show or a, a news station. Anyways, um, okay, Moving so on. so anyways, uh, <laughs> February 24th, 1978. There is a group of gentlemen, like you said before, mm-hmm. um, five gentlemen from Oroville in Yuba City, or is it Yuba City or is it Yuba County? I think it's Yuba County. It was Yuba County. Yeah. yeah. Or in Yuba City. Yeah. Um, also, if you guys, at any point in time, just jump in if you want to say something about whatever. I'm just going to quickly run through and set the setting for what's now going on. Off to you. Now off to you. Okay. Uh, you guys are terrible. Just rehash that joke again. <laughs> uh, so, um, anyway, so these uh, gentlemen knew each other because they played in a basketball team um, known as the Gateway Gators as part of an extracurricular activity to kind of help them with uh, their mental illnesses. Now, a little, okay. spe- a, little, a little understanding there. Gateway was a program that worked with those that had either mental disabilities or limitations such as mental health issues. Right. So it was, a, it was a basketball team for this program that they were all a part of. Yeah, it was to help them kind of overcome their mental disabilities, um, which a couple of them had. Uh, I can quickly run through exactly like what they, what was going on with them. Like, okay, so... Um, William Sterling, uh, he just had the, all these guys kind of had like social issues. Like the, some of them didn't have common sense. They needed like help with basic tasks. Yeah. So we can we can like go that. through the whole list of it. But really, there's five of them of of the five. Four of them had mental learning disabilities, which basically mean they had low IQ. One of them being really really low. Um, but they were all ranging in low mental disabilities, meaning that they just had trouble understanding, learning, and processing daily <laughs> issues. Yeah, and I think um, I saw law enforcement even documented that um, two or three of them had IQs as low as 40. Correct. Which would categorize them as moderate to severe disability. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the last one, the fourth one, didn't have those such disabilities, but was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, 
and and violent issues and violent by, issues by tied to all that. And yeah. he was he was also one of the members that was in the military formerly. Right. All right. Um. And we'll and we'll go through those again later on. But I just wanted to kind of set the stage that these these people are not just you know your average Joe. There are they're a special group. Like literally, right, right. they and were brought together because of the disabilities. That's that's how they became friends. Um, yeah. And so they. Yes. They leaned heavily on each other. Yeah, they not right. Um, and uh, yeah, so they are a very special group. Um, so these uh, these gentlemen, uh, one evening, um, were going to watch a basketball game at Chico State University, mm-hmm. um, and they were playing against their favorite team, which was UC Davis at the time. So they went and drove an hour and a half to Chico from Orville to watch the. Uh, the state basketball game. And so on their way there, they, uh, well, nothing actually happened on the way there. They went there just fine. But uh, after the game ended, they stopped by a nearby convenience store. They grabbed some snack. Um, nothing out of the ordinary with these snacks. I mean, like, I think the, there was like a, a few candy bars, some, uh, some pies. I heard, I saw uh, like cartons of milk. Yeah. I thought, who drinks milk? It was a quart of milk. Yeah. I was like, um, <laughs> this is already getting. St- you know, I'm I'm I mean, feeling like there's some stories being it, made up here. I mean, if I'm smashing some ho hos or some, you know, okay, pies, maybe no, it's you a, you, know. maybe you buy a Yahoo or something. It's but like, like me and the boys out getting cans of milk, or it, cans, cartons of milk. They literally <laughs> called it cartons of milk, and I thought to myself, these really are thirsty. And uh, stop. No, it was it, it. That's the only weird thing. I mean, like they they got pies too, so I guess maybe if you want milk with your pie, I, I don't know. So, um, anyways, they nothing super out of the ordinary. It was just strange that they would buy milk uh but anyways so um they're they're super excited their team their team actually won uc davis i don't know if i said that or not but uc davis actually won uh, over chico state that day go aggies yep and then uh they started their route back home right it was another hour and a half drive home and so normally they would take uh 99 south to um to the to 70 mm-hmm. and then 70 south back to orville right that's that's normally the route. But what happened was they actually took 99 South. And when they were supposed to get on 70 South, they actually got on 70 North. And so they just flipped, you know, right up into the mountain area. And so they're they're now they're trekking into, you know, um, I don't think any of them really knew where they were going. They must have taken a wrong turn or something. Um, there, there's some other theories that they, you know, were following somebody, but we'll get into that later. They end up in the mountains. Um, the road ends eventually, and they have to start um, driving on uh, just rugged terrain. And the it's rug- also rugged dirt road. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like um, like a snowing right now because it's winter um, up there. And so there's uh, so allegedly their car gets stuck, although we don't have any evidence for that. We'll get into that later. But eventually the car stops. For some reason, we're assuming it gets stuck. And then at some point, they all exit the vehicle and start walking. Um, so that's. Um, kind of like the the setting right now um i can go into why or i can go into like anything after that if you want to unless you guys want to talk about any of the stuff well, I, and I previously I, said and again just to reiterate um due to mental disabilities i mean these were all men in between the ages of 24 and 32 and all living at home with family mm-hmm. so um it's not like you know they they didn't come home and, and nobody missed them for for a week no that you know the, the second they didn't come home that night and first thing in the morning, all their families were, were. Yeah. The report shows and, that the families were calling each other to say, Hey, did they come home? And right. so they were aware. I mean, they, they were high functioning, right? Which means that they, Absolutely. one of them had, a, at least one of them, we know well, at least one of them had a driver's license, but it appears to be that two of them had driver's license. Mm-hmm. Um, but only one of them had a car yeah. and that it was his pride and joy. Right. It was, I think that the Montego or something like yeah. that, but it was the pride 69. and joy. So he, he you know, yeah. They were high functioning to be able to dr- get in the car with disabilities and drive an hour and a half to go to a basketball game. At least two of them were. At, at least two of them were, but for, for five of them to go, and these are people that all live with their parents from 24 to 32, um, even the parents had an had a, had a inkling that these, these men were going to be capable of doing this trip. Right. So, um, but yeah, no, them not coming home right away, um, it did prompt them to call each other and say, have you seen each, have you seen them? No. Okay. And then the, the law enforcement was called immediately. It wasn't like a missing report where they were called days later. This was immediately, Hey, my son with these, with these disabilities is missing. 
Uh, and that's kind of where that starts. Now we can go into this early part, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if we should lay the entire story out before we. Well, before I get into like what happens after this and uh, because everything beyond this point is, uh, speculation. is speculation because we don't know exactly what transpired afterwards. Um, we do have one eyewitness that we can talk about. But before we do that, I want to talk about the names of these people and then who, their relation to each other. Um, just so that when we go forward and I talk about their names, that people know who, right. I, who we're talking right. and about. And I can, I can throw up an image of the five, uh, that newspaper article that you see in just about everything. Right. That, uh, I'll throw that up in one of the ads this week so people can see who we're talking about. Okay. So number one, the first person um, on this list is Jack Madruga. Okay. This is the person we know has, has a driver's license. Um, because he's the owner of the 69 uh, Mercury Montego. Okay. Um, do you guys have any, like, do you guys have any examples of his mental disability or anything well, like that? And, and so let's also, this was one thing I read. Um, I did not see this. I only saw this in one article and one video I watched. Uh, Jack Madruga was never officially diagnosed, though. His family listed all sorts of things his entire life and, right. and clearly, you know, showed that he had some mental disabilities, but right. it is known that he was never diagnosed by a doctor. He was the one that was specifically discharged from the military for a low IQ of around 40. Correct. So I know that there was, there was actually a member, which is the youngest member at 24, who was actually had a lower IQ than him, but he was the one that was one of the two that was discharged from the, uh, from the military because of he, yeah, his, his IQ was his right. learning abilities yeah. like enabled or disabled him from being able to to move forward. Mm -hmm. Right. And and also there was like incidences like he worked for he worked at a production line mm -hmm. and couldn't figure out basic functions with the production line. So they had to let him go. Right. So. Yeah. He he struggled with jobs. Uh, I know that um, at one point he worked as a dishwasher or something. Um, but yeah. So ex exactly. He struggled with basic tasks. Right. Um, but he could drive his Mercury Montego. Um, I don't know if it was handed down to him or how he acquired a Mercury Montego, but I'm assuming it's, you know, from his parents. But he, and he passed the California driving test. True. Yeah. It, yeah. it also, when I was reading, they said that the car was meticulous, which means that he he took high care of it. Right. It was very qual. So the guy wasn't incapable. He just had learning disabilities that prevented him from progressing in jobs and being able to understand, you know, mm -hmm. things that would be required to complete those jobs. Right. Um, but it didn't make him a capable person. Um, often too, we're going to get into the other people, but he, this guy was the one that was willing to help some of the inabilities of the other one. For instance, I think the youngest one is Jack Hewitt. I could be wrong, but I think Jack Hewitt was the 24 year old. Correct, he, yeah. he had, he had issues with talking to people on the phone. Right. And they said that Jack Maruga was the one that would actually help him in those conversations on the phone. So he had an ability, which means that he had a little bit higher IQ than some of the other members. Uh, and he had, a, he had compassionate and that type to help his friends accomplish things that they would struggle at. Uh, which is what made them their friendship stronger. But anyways, uh, continue on, Cody. Yeah. So anyway, the second person is William Sterling. This is Madruga's best friend. Okay. He's extremely religious, um, spend a lot of time um, reading to patients in mental hospitals to help console them. So a really nice guy. I mean, I think he also struggled with a lot of like maybe social and mental disabilities as well. But I mean, he still you know, could obviously read and, you know, had, he was articulate enough to be able to read to patients and kind of help them through, you know, their struggles as well. And just a little bullet point on Bill, William Sterling, mm -hmm. uh, his mother went on record to say that Bill did not like the outdoors. No, did you see this? He went on like one fishing trip with his family yeah. and they're like, as soon as it was over, he said he would never do it again. Never again. And then never did with the family. Absolutely wow. did not like the outdoors. So, you know, just put that piece there for a minute and we'll. We'll come back. Wow. Okay. That's something I did not know that. We'll note that. Um, and then number three is uh, Theodore Wheeler or Ted Wheeler. Um, this is the oldest and um, he, he valued his friendship with the group. Like he put it on a pedestal. He like really, really loved hanging out with these guys. It was like his pride and joy to just be around all his friends right here. Um, but an, an interesting thing about Ted Wheeler is he had little to no common sense right. about anything. No. Um, I don't know if you guys saw this, but he once bought a hundred dollars worth of pencils yeah. for no reason. And you know what? We'll get into the later part of the story, but that again, that same notion that you're talking about ties into some of the, the, the things that weren't used at the place that they end up. Uh, because the mom said that, that literally at one point in time, the house was on fire and they had to go in and pull him out of his bed. And his response to that was, I have work in the morning. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, like his common sense is, hey, we're, the house is on fire. You need to get out. You're going to get hurt. And he's like, I have work in the morning. I got to go to sleep. So he had. He's he, not he wrong. Com- <laughs> he's not wrong. But he completely lacked uh, the ability to read the room. Yeah. And, and understand urgency. what's going on in urgency. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So he's a he's a character. Um, Jack Hewitt is the next one. This is Ted's best friend. Um, he, he relied on Ted and Jack to help perform basic tasks, like you said earlier, like dialing phone numbers. Yeah, and I, I got that mixed up. It was Ted was the one that relied, or Jack relied on Ted, not um, Jack Maruga, but same concept. Yeah, Jack they, Hewitt relied on Ted. Yes, yeah. correct. I said, I said he Jack relied re- on you Jack. You said Jack relied on Ted, or Ted relied on no, Jack. No, no, no. Mar- I said Madruga. Jack Hewitt relied on Jack Mar- Maruga. Yeah. Maruga. But uh, I was actually, he relied on Ted, who was the oldest member of the group, to help him out. They were really close friends. Yeah. We'll, we'll call them by their last names just to kind of help because there's two Jacks and there's like a Ted Correct. and a, yeah. a Bill. So we'll call them Madruga, Sterling, Wheeler, Hewitt, and Matthias. That works. So, yeah, again, Hewitt was Ted's best friend, relied, um, relied on him to help him with basic tasks like dialing phone numbers, right? So he also struggled with, you know, basic problem solving and performing. And he was the one that was known to have out of everyone. I mean, they all had, again, some level of disability but he was the one that was known to have the most severe disability mm-hmm. who was this IQ, um that would be hewitt yes hewitt yeah he hewitt. was the youngest of the group but he was the one that had the most severe i think they said he had also the most uh, the highest uh social yeah. uh disability meaning like, that he struggled in yeah, interactions with people and everything yeah. in person or on phone like right. he, he he struggled in all, all regards so he heavily relied on members of the team in this particular case uh is it wire where Weird. ted um, he relied heavily Wire. on Ted to uh, to do things. I just call him Wheeler. Wheeler. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if it's Wire or Wheeler. I just call him Wheeler. It's Wheeler. It's- His name's Wheeler now. He's dead. So yeah. um, oh. anyway. Cody. So <laughs> anyways, the next person is. <laughs> this took a morbid turn. Yeah. So oh, I got the open for the show. Yeah. <laughs> so the next guy is um, Gary Matthias. He will be known as Matthias from now on. My boy, Gary. My boy, Gary. So briefly served in the army right this is the other guy who served in the in the military um but uh, i don't know how do you guys know how long he served i don't i didn't get any no of that. so one of the things we can say is that he you know with the schizophrenia he had been clean on, on medication for two years now he's only 25 at this point so military you, you really can't go in until you're 17 or 18 at the earliest right 17 you have to have your family sign you in if you have a mental disability i have a hard time believing your family signing you in so let's assume that he goes in at 18 He's going to be in there a year, maybe a year and a half before he gets discharged. So I would assume that there's a period of time where he has no medication and he is gone going bonkers. Um, so I, I would assume was, it's less was, than two years. And he was serving overseas in Germany. And had, which tells me he went through boot camp, which is six to eight months, depending on the training. Right. 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 Yeah. So because he was stationed. He was stationed in Germany and he had psychiatric break. And, you know, they evaluated him and discharged him. Yeah, and, and oftentimes, too, schizophrenia doesn't always come at, like, a low, young age. He, he could have had his schizophrenic break in the midst of being in the military. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He could have triggered it or something. 100%. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but yeah, again, like Andy said, this person did suffer from severe schizophrenia. And we mentioned that early on as far as one of the members being a schizophrenic. Now, I'm going to bring this up because I, this is one of the points that was made uh, in some of the research I was doing was Gateway was a program for those with limited or with mental disabilities. It wasn't necessarily a program for mental health. Now, I know that that, that kind of confuses, but what I meant by that is like a diagnosis such as schizophrenia um, isn't necessarily correlated with the same thing as, say, like a social disability where you have trouble uh, processing information. Um, people were finding it interesting that he would end up in the same program as them because it's, it's, different. Like it's right. different. Now, I could be wrong. I'm not a doctor, but it just seemed odd to me that a schizophrenia would end up with four other guys that are struggling from things like social, social disabilities or dyslexia, that kind of thing. Well, that's what the, so the one of the, again, one of the reports I, I, <laughs> I read also never categorized him as having learning disabilities or anything along never. that. Never. Yeah. In fact, what, when it was talking about the five, it's, it said four out of the five had learning and mental disabilities. The fifth had Yeah, they specified. They, they separated him completely within but the But he report. was clinically diagnosed. He yeah. was on medication and appara- according to his his dad and his mother um, had been clear had been clean. Yeah. What I mean by is no no outburst or anything like that in, in the past few years. Uh, I think the dad even referred to it as no crazy havoc. He did he didn't create any havoc in two years <laughs> after being on the medication. Yeah, he was working he was working for uh, Yeah, yeah. His he was doing manual labor. So I 
here's the one thing I and, landscaping and I look back three times. It said father in law. Now I, I don't know if that was a typo in the. I so I saw this too and immediately I couldn't find was he. My thought, he must have been married, right? My thought process was, was he married? Um, I didn't actually dig into this very much, and I, we can do, I can do it right now while we're talking, but I, when I saw that, I thought he worked for his father-in-law's landscape, landscape business, business yeah. and I thought, okay, well, that's kind of cool, but then I went, wait a minute, this is father-in-law. Was he married? And it never mentions a wife. They, 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 like Any of the reports don't go on to say that they, right. that they interviewed the so, wife or anything. I'm going to look it up, but my theory before I look it up is that he got married before he went to the military, or he got married at a young age, probably before the schizophrenia stuff came in. Um, but if he's still connected to the father-in-law at this point at 25, um, I would assume he's still married, right? You would assume he's still married and that she's just yeah. hanging out with him, you know, helping him through this process. Of, right. And maybe she just doesn't break. want anything to do with any of this because maybe we'll find out anyways, later, you know, we can move on Cody. Deeper. Okay. So yeah. So now we've established the, uh, the names of the gentlemen. Um, I'll go into and, and continue on into this, this story. So um, where we left off, they were in a, was seemed like off the, off the road, they're on a rugged terrain. It's snowing. There's a somewhat of a blizzard going on. Um, it's a harsh winter. They exit the vehicle um, and they start walking. Um, so Monday, the day the, the game was on Sunday. So Monday, the forest rangers scout out the area because obviously they're getting calls from the from the parents, like kind of worried. So forest rangers start scouting the area um, up in the mountains, you know. And so they find the car and on arrival, the car was not stuck. It wasn't, you know, they didn't have to move it. It would, it was completely movable. Um, and, uh, the car was found in, like you said, immaculate condition. Um, they had, uh, th- yeah, cause there's five of these guys in, in an already low car. Well, it's a heavy car. Yeah. Right. It's a 1969, yep. uh, Montego. So it's a, it's a pretty heavy, beefy car. Yeah. And there's five fully grown men stuffed into it. Correct. And the fact that they didn't like just tear up the bottom end of it or like the, n- nothing, nothing was scratched up or anything. It was, al- it was almost a guarantee that that would be the case, but for whatever reason it was not. And it was in immaculate condition. The only thing was on the inside, there was, you know, obviously a bunch of trash from their wrappers and pies and milk. Um, <laughs> so there's all that trash in there. Party animals. Yeah, no. And so, but they had exited the vehicle and then started walking the door, the, Window was rolled down, which we'll get, maybe might get into a little bit later. Um, but the windows rolled down, uh, one of the windows, not all of them, but one of them was. And so they, they exit the vehicle and leave, right? Um, but uh, so after they find this vehicle, which was the owner of one of the missing, uh, missing, missing uh, five, uh, they sent, uh, they called, uh, I think it was Orville PD or a n- nearby local police department, and they put out search. It was Yuba County parties. Sheriff, actually. Oh, Yuba County Sheriff's Office. Yeah. So. Uh, I knew they're called the authorities of some kind. So uh, um, five day search party, uh, search parties were sent out to comb this surrounding area where the car was to try and find out. Actually, the search party started sooner and it was 20 miles from Chico because that's where they assumed them to be. Uh, the undersheriff for Yuba County, basically after about five days of searching, said, hey, we need to find we need to expand our search. And when they expanded the search, they found the car 70 miles away from the direction they were supposed to have been going. Once they found the car, they moved the search party up there and searched again for, for another, another five, days. another four or five days. But during this time, there was a big storm that came in. Yeah, so exactly. On Sunday, there was a really big storm that came in and a lot of people from the search parties nearly, nearly did die from searching in, the, in these harsh conditions already because it's already winter and it's really cold up there. But, um, but they called it off and they said, okay, you know what? Everybody stop searching. Um, we're going to pick this back up when the ice melts and it's spring um so that's what they did but they didn't find anything four months pass okay it is now june okay um and a group of bikers like motorcyclists um stop for a moment at an abandoned forest service trailer it's like right off the side of the road they just kind of stop for a second um they notice the first thing they notice is a terrible smell coming from one of the trailers the main trailer and then as soon as they started to investigate, they found a broken window that led into the trailer. Um, upon further investigation of getting in the trailer, breaking in, they find a body with sheets over it. Um, uncovering the body, they um, were able to determine that this was, not the motorcyclist, but eventually when they obviously called the authorities, this body was the body of Ted Wheeler, okay? One of the, one of the five men who were missing uh, for dead. several months. He was found 80 pounds lighter 
So he was originally 200 pounds. He was found 120 pounds. Details on how he was found too, or like what he looked like when he was found was kind of crazy to me. He was wrapped up in eight blankets. His shoes were missing and he had lost like five four toes. or five toes, yeah. right? So he was, he would got, I believe he had gone from like 220 pounds down to like a hundred and something. Like he had lost a lot of weight. 120. Yeah. Uh, I think nearly half of his body weight. I'm going and, on that diet. Let's go. Um, I'm, if you, what? I'm shaking my head. What, Stop. What you hey, you want to, you want to go up into the mountains? You want to hang out? <sighs> want to hang out? We can go yeah. see a basketball game. Invite, invite your um, off. Candy wrappers I wanted to and correct something. I wanted to correct something real quick. Uh, mm-hmm. We had mentioned that they came from Orville. That's not where they came from. They started in Yuba, uh, Yuba City, Marysville, that Marysville. area. Yeah. And they drove up to Chico. And on their way back, instead of coming straight down, they took one of the off-roads off of that 99 exit that took them up into the mountains in Orville. So it's not like they were intentionally going into Orville. They were intentionally going from Marysville to Chico. And they were supposed to be coming back down. Yeah. And in the process, pulled off into the mountains and got stuck on this dirt road. So I, I, I before I got too deep, I was like looking. I was like, wait a minute. No, I thought so too. But it's, they were coming from Marysville, Yuba City, and, that area. And so... Yeah, that's what I said. And so, so the, they were leaving from... So they're leaving from Orville to Chico. No, they did, from, not, they did not go to... Or- Orville is where they ended up when the bodies were found. They never went... To, they weren't coming from Orville. Orville is where the, the bodies were found. No, they're found in like... Way up uh, by by the lake by Lake Orville is where they're found, like way up north. Yeah, Lake Orville and Orville are the same thing. Uh, it's Orville's a city near Lake Orville. Uh, but yes, I can show you what okay. I'm to what I'm referring so to. They were in Podunkville, USA. Listen, so Ted missing five toes. How many pounds lighter? That was- he went from two twenty to one twenty, like a hundred pounds lighter. Okay. Yeah. Um. And so when the police, of course, you know, but with the weight loss as well as hair growth. They they said that he survived. They you know estimate he survived about twelve weeks. Yeah, twelve to thirteen weeks. I saw that they said twelve to thirteen weeks. He's laying there, starving. Well, not weight. necessarily lay, laying there. They did say that based on what they found in the cabin, they ass- they estimated that he was alive for up to thirteen weeks. Well, yeah, and they, they said hair growth too because they okay can, okay because your, your hair start you know it stops growing right. when you no longer. Is that true? I thought I always heard that your hair and nails continue to grow after you die. I don't know. I'm just reading. I was just reading the police report. I want, I listen, when I go, I want you guys to check. Yeah. <laughs> can you can you do that for me? Can you guys just listen? Cody, I, can you mark that down? Can you mark that it down for me? Goes out, we're this gonna, is we're verbal cro- do some contract. And, you know, we're going to have to tell his wife that he agreed to this and, you know, can't bury him. We're just going to lay him there for 12 to 13 weeks. Guys, it's, and, it's so expensive to get buried. Like I told my wife, like, just torch me up. It's fine. <laughs> like, and it doesn't have to be weird. You don't have to put me on a, on a mantle or anything. Just sprinkle me on my Xbox and I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so continuing on, um, after, so after they find, oh, you have something to well, say? Well, I just, uh, did we say how far the trailer was from the car? Not yet. I'm getting, oh, okay. My apologies. Yeah. Go ahead. No, you're good. Um, so, after they like determined that this body was uh, Ted Wheeler's, um, they uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. But I just want to point out some details about the room um, from earlier uh, that kind of we kind of hinted at. So this room was found, and there was several cans of food that were opened, but then there was also a vast majority of that cans of food that were unopened that weren't even attempted to be opened yet. They were just kind of in perfect condition, ready to be opened and eaten. And then there was no effort to cover up the window that was broken into to get into the to the service trailer. So there was just always cold air coming into this trailer. Right. Um, but, it, but it goes back to that thing we were talking about with Ted. Now, assuming other people made it there, we know you're probably going to go into that. But I think we know that for a fact that three members actually made it to the trailer. Yeah, it's we, we think that well, because of we found the boot, we found the boots of Matthias inside the trailer. So we're assuming that um, he was in there at some point. I mean, obviously, maybe. Well, we know that Ted's we know that Ted's boots were missing, and that Gary's shoes or Matthias' shoes were left there. So we the assumption is that Gary has Ted's boots because Ted was wearing boots, Gary was wearing well, tennis shoes. And there's one other thing I found really cool. I don't know if you guys saw this. So the cans that were opened mm-hmm. were opened by a specific kind of can opener. Oh, oh I did see this, and I, I've seen this can opener because my 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 father is was career military mm-hmm. and it 
good luck trying to figure it out. But they are they are these they're designed to be able to pack and you know because they have to pack tightly in mm. the military. And so these can openers are are like military type can opener. Like you would have to have known how to use this can opener to open it. And they that's what opened these cans. Turn. I actually went and watched a video on how it works. And right. if you don't have experience with it, like having watched the video, I'm like, how in the world? Right. But uh, if you don't have experience with it, there's no way you would have been able to figure it out. So it, that in itself, outside of the assumption of the shoes, um, makes me to believe that it's either Ted or Gary is one of the ones that would open that can the canned food that way. Now, Ted lacking common sense, uh, it, it's probably easy to believe that Gary is the one that was able to open up the the food itself. But it was a very weird. Uh, there's a name for it, and I can't remember what the name well, of remember, it was. So Madruga and so Madruga and Gary are the two military guys. Correct. So it would suggest that either one or both of them were also in the uh, trailer with him. Mm -hmm. So because common sense guy, you know, give him that military can opener. Yeah, you know, he's already struggling to cover up windows. Right. So I did also see, and I'm gonna just. This is not a correction, but it's basically what I was seeing when they were t when they were showing the photos of the actual cabin because you were able to look up the photos that there was food and everything that was that they did eat that was inside the actual trailer. But I guess there was a storage area that was unlocked and open next to it that they had gone into. They said there was there was evidence that they had gone in there, but there was dried food packages and clothing that would keep them warm. Um, yeah, I saw and that. They didn't a use years of worth of a years worth of dried rations. I mean, right. that's. They're looking at it like... They now, I think Cody had laid this guys. out in our pre-conversation, but this was a uh, Forrester's trailer mm -hmm. that had been basically abandoned, but yeah. I mean, it still had things in it, which makes me believe that they were just no longer using it. And these dried rations probably last years. So they're probably fine and they could have been used to be eaten. But not only that, like there's a, a, a weird note that Ted told his mother as he was leaving, he didn't need a jacket tonight. Right. Right. Like things like that. But there was plenty of weather, winter wet wear in the in that area that they could have used to help them keep warm mm. uh and they didn't do any of that either or didn't touch any of it yeah all right let's the story let's get the story going yeah no it was very strange that none of this none of that stuff was even looked at or used or as you could see i mean the we're seeing examples of their mental capacity possibly you know, because you know you can't you know you what to i mean to us it's plain to see like oh there's obviously stuff we can use here to help solve this issue but they just for whatever reason, did not do that. Um, and it comes down to their mental capabilities. So um, anyway, after that's found, um, oh, I didn't say how far it was. It was 19 miles away from the car. So quite a trek. Yeah. Um, especially if you're walking in the snow um, to get to this area. I don't, I don't know. There, there's, got, there's something missing here because you, I don't know if someone can hike 19 miles you know, in the snow with nothing but milk, candy. I mean, there's not even, they don't even have candy wrappers. All the wrappers were found in the car don't have any food or anything like that so minimal snow clothing you know what i mean very i mean maybe some of them had jackets maybe some maybe one of them had boots but like 19 miles in mountainy area i don't know well, I, and it was coming down heavy too and i think i even saw in the reports that the rappers weren't just inside the car they were outside the car which means that they got out and they were outside of the car eating maybe before they made the trek so not only did they walk apparently walk 19 miles but they actually hung out in the snow outside the car for at least a couple of minutes before trekking. Um, man, I, I find it hard to believe. I, me, I don't know if I could like walk down the street. Yeah, 19 miles is no special feat. And it said, uh, uh, again, one of the police reports I said, it wasn't like it was a horizontal linear path. It was uphill. It had an up gra uphill grade. So they were climbing a hill, not probably nothing severe, but still 19 miles, slight upgrade, uh, slight uphill. Not like they had a bunch of winter gear, you know, snowshoes or any of that, and they and they got to this trailer or supposedly got to this trailer. Somebody did. Yeah, eventually. I mean, at, at least, least three of them. The body. Of them made we it have there, proof yeah. of three. Yep. Or or I don't know if it's proof, but we have evidence of three members making it to the well, trailer. And that's the other thing that's talking about. If well, the body did right. Well, uh, th these you know, if they if if let's say he did. Again, he survived 12 to 13 weeks. So he, where would he have survived? I mean, he had to have been in the trailer a lot. Yeah, they you also know, said... Not, like, he made it there. They also said with the amount of damage and, and that he had as far as on his frostbite on his feet, that he, with the amount of weight loss and with the damage to his feet, he would have been unable or incapable of actually wrapping himself in the blanket. 
So somebody else wrapped him, put the eight blankets on him to wrap him up to keep him warm. So my guess is, is in that 13 weeks, he got ill from the frostbite or some, or, or just a loss of weight laid on the bed and somebody was there to help take care of him, or at least wrap him up, try to make him warm in that, yeah. that regard. So somebody else was there with him. The evidence shows that it was the other two members that, that Cody already listed, but all right, keep going. There's, yeah. So, um, after they found this body, um, this kind of kind of kickstarted the, uh, it was the, you know, push they needed to kind of get this case back open because obviously it's been a few months and they kind of really haven't found anything. So once they found that they had a, you know, a kind of a general area of where to start looking for, you know, either bodies or maybe even the people. So, uh, search parties were sent out around the area. It would only take a few days to find two more bodies, the bodies of Jack Madruga and William Sterling. And they were found five miles south of the uh, trailer, the abandoned trailer. Um, so something of note is that the keys to the car, the Mercury Montego, was found in Madruga's pocket, the owner, which is, isn't out of the ordinary, but it, it, it'll help us in another theory we'll talk about later. Um, and um, Madruga was found partially eaten by animals, supposedly. I have a different theory. Um, for Sterling... <laughs> For Sterling, his remains were kind of scattered around in the same location, but he was just bone. There was nothing, there was no flesh. It was all bone. It says that the autopsy showed that they both died of hypothermia, oh, right? Okay. So the idea would be, and this was, you're correct, they were found south of the cabin, which means that they, the, the theory, and I'm sure you're going to go into your own theory, but the theory is that they died on the way to the cabin. Yeah. It, but yeah, possibly on the way to, well, yeah, on the way to the cabin, because, uh, I mean, isn't one of them, uh, isn't this head? Oh, wait, wait. Oh, William Sterling. No, none of these people were at the... I mean, maybe they could have been. Madruga and Sterling are the two that, that were found south. Yeah, I, I was just talking about if there's any correlation to them in the trailer, but maybe they were found. Well, they so just died on the way to the trailer. this now scratches off one of the military guys being in the trailer, if you potentially believe that they died before they got to the trailer. Well, yeah. again, theory, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So now this, this leaves... If that's the case, that leaves only Gary able to open those cans. Mm -hmm. True. Um, and a few days after that, the father of Jack Hewitt, interestingly enough, um, one of the, Jack Hewitt being one of the guys, um, the father discovers the clothes belonging to his son, um, and also his remains shortly after. Yeah. Um, they were in an area a few miles south of the service trailer. North, north. The key is north. He, his body was found north, two miles north of the actual trailer. Northeast. A few miles north of the service trailer. Uh, that's important. That's because it's part of my theory. It's important for my theory. And uh, interestingly enough, there were service blankets and flashlights uh, found right next to the body, uh, mm -hmm. close by the road, too. That were probably taken from the, probably taken from the service trailer. So uh, that's all the that's all we really know about. Like at well, least with like hard evidence. And and so just since we haven't, I don't think we've said it yet. Gary's body is the only one. That hasn't been found. No traces of Gary have been found. Correct. So four out of the five, we know that they are deceased. So laying our foundation, so we can jump into theories, because I really want to jump into theories. Yes. You have five young men that have, uh, four of them have mental disabilities, and the last one has a uh, mental illness of uh, schizophrenia. They go on a trip down to Chico. They go, oh, sorry, go north from Yuba City, Marysville, up to Chico to watch a basketball game. Their team wins. They're excited. They go eat. They grab some, or sorry, they go grab some stuff from a gas station. And along the way, they take a detour. Instead of continuing back down home to Marysville, Yuba City, they take a detour and they go east, kind of northeast towards um, Orville area. Um, the car is found, or the, the they, uh, assuming their car breaks down, or it doesn't break down, it gets stuck in the snow. Uh, they get out. They make a trek of about 19 miles to a an old abandoned forest uh, service trailer. Um, to which we know, or we assume and know that, well, we assume three members were. One body was found there, but we have evidence of at least one other member there, uh, possibly two. And I'll get into that, that, that third one um, at the very end. Um, it's, only, it's, not, it's not until the spring that they're able to identify this. Now, this all happened in the fall. The winter was happening. The storm was coming in. It was heavy. There was no way for them to do a search because the snow was coming down too heavy. Once the snow melted, some bikers found the trailer, uh, and then the search began. And that's where the two bodies are found south of the trailer. Um, one body was found north of the trailer. And then one body was found inside the trailer. 
there was nothing, nothing was ever found of Gary. There's no, no evidence of where he was, where he went. We just have evidence that he was present in the trailer. And before we get into theories, I think we should just real quick touch on three different, um, witnesses, right? Uh, two that witnessed the supposedly witnessed the boys, the men themselves, and then one that got, well, got some phone calls. Okay. So we're just going to touch on these real quick so that it can, and then we can get into theories. So the first one is, of course, Mr. Joseph Stones. Mr. Joseph Stones was an individual who was um, traveling in that area, supposedly to just test the roads and, and the weather because the next day he wanted to bring his family up for some getaway. And so he's driving in his VW. Uh, his VW, you know, uh, lost some traction. He needed to get out and push. Supposedly started having a heart attack. Uh, saw during this episode of a heart attack, he saw two different sets of lights, one believed to uh, have been belonging to a truck. Um, and then he then saw a group of men and a woman and a baby getting out of what he claimed to be the Mercury that Jack drove. All right. Well, he, he saw this Mercury. Um, he then yelled, supposedly yelled and they utterly ignored him. So here's this man on the side of the road. He sees he sees them, yells for help, and no response. They even said that the lights cut out. The headlights from the cars cut out when he yelled for help. That was one of the articles that I saw. Was that it's as if they did hear him respond by turning off and right or, or going away. So so there you go. You have Mr. Joseph Stone's supposedly eyewitness. Okay. Um, the next one, and and this one's kind of. Strange. So this happened on the 24th, right? Mm -hmm. This is at 24th at night. February 24th. February 24th. A, a store clerk claimed on February 25th at 2 p.m. that all five men came in uh, or came to the store, that two of them walked into the store, and one of them being uh, Jack, uh, by the way, Jack Hewitt, who supposedly has uh, issues with phone and stuff like that, and that Jack and Bill were the ones that came in. Um, that's who she pointed out and claimed to use the, the phone in the, in the store. The other three sat inside a truck outside. Um, her boss backed her story and uh, police, after uh, interviewing and everything, claimed she is a credible witness. Okay, so this is next day, 2 p.m., February 25th, um, after they had supposedly gone missing. She saw them. So, um, that's again, interesting because it, it kind of, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, I don't want to say make sense, but I mean, it just, it would, I guess you could, it's a possible theory because the car, all we know about what happened on the next day is that the car was abandoned, right? The bodies hadn't been found yet. There was no, there's no, no search party yet. The families were just worried and they called the forester and the forester found the car and that was it. So this is, so they, there's mixed, there's mixed, um, stories on this because I actually heard that she was the last witness of them and it was the 24th. That was this on, the, there was two, but I saw the one, I saw a couple of articles where it said it was the 25th that she had seen in the next day. But the article that I saw was it was bear market. She was getting ready to close around 10 PM that night and five men walked in. And the reason she remembered that is because it made her irritated that she could not continue to shut down. I saw that too, but I think this is two different store clerks of two different stores. That's what I was reading. So because there's no, other than her witness of it, there's not any, you know, there's nothing, they are just taking it on what she said, but this was. This one, oh, so the this one is a talking completely about? separate store. This, that's almost identical to the story of the bear market one where they stopped to get food. Well, the difference with Aaron's, Aaron's second story is that this one had a different car and only two people walked in. And, and used so, the phone. Yeah, and used the phone. And then the other first one we're talking about, all of them went inside. And loaded up on candy. And loaded up on candy, and, oh, and that's okay. why they I couldn't leave. The okay. Yeah. I'm, okay, maybe I'm mixing the two stories together because they're so similar. No, they I are do remember the parents yeah. saying that. Too, yeah. I do remember the parents saying that it was highly unlikely that Jack Hewitt used the phone because right. of his social uh, awkwardness and his inability, like his, he had a panic attack when he talked to people on the phone. So um, I know that that was like an argument there that, that that's probably not a possibility. Now, this is where they mentioned the truck, right? I, I, this is where, yeah, the mm -hmm. three of them, stayed, the other three stayed in the truck. And again, the, the store manager backed her story and the, the police, they, they did their grueling interview of her and in the end counted her as a credible witness. So they, they believed her well enough that it, so she's telling the truth. 
So again, this is the next day at 2 p.m., middle of the day, after they've gone missing, they're now in the truck, they've ditched the car, and they're using the phone calling whoever, okay? Um, and then the third, we're going to just throw this third one in, and, you know, there's not really any... I didn't, couldn't find anything whether or not they fully believe this one or not, so who knows, but three weeks after the disappearance, a woman by the name of Debbie got multiple phone calls. The first one was a man um, saying he knows where the men are. The next call, which I believe was the next day, the same man, according to her, saying the, uh, he hurt them. I did bad things to them. I did bad they things need to help. them, yes. And then the third call, again, the same man saying, they're all dead. So now you got this woman saying she's got somebody calling her, basically telling her he murdered the men. Mm. But again, the police have said that all, all of them died of, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it natural causes. Well, but only not one. A, so exposure think, to the element. Yes, right. Yeah, only no one of them was un, undetermined. And they assume right. hyperthermia, but it was undetermined. I don't remember which one it was, but it was one of the remains that was found out in the, in the wilderness. Probably the bones. Probably like, uh, well, I, yeah, I, but I mean, I'm they assuming. Were, they were <laughs> yeah. able, well, yeah. the three that were found out in the snow were all bones, right? I mean, I assume the one that was in there, but they were able to tell he had lost his toes from frostbite. So maybe the one inside the, the shelter, or the, the cabin, they said they could still smell it. So it still had meat. He was a rotting corpse. He yeah. was a rotting corpse. The other three were, had been, we assumed. And he was 120 pounds. So he wasn't just bone. He was, he was a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're right. He was 120 pounds when they was yeah. So, um. But where's his toes at? I'm well, telling, dude. Frostbite. Matthias you, ate them. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. That's my theory. Mm. Matthias mm. is a. Oh. And, and we're just. Cannibal. Since Matthias. Cannibal. Since Matthias is missing. I do want to put a couple pieces out there about Matthias, uh, just because. Don't break my theory apart. Oh, don't start putting it like his. Well, some, I just I, I read his, this and it was kind of cool. Some of his past is important to my theory. Well, okay, so again, I just you know Gary was there's was there's a point where Gary was up in Oregon, and this is this is stuff that his his family had said. Gary was once out in Oregon, and he traveled five hundred and or five hundred and forty miles on foot from Oregon to Marysville. And when he showed up, he said he survived on stolen milk and dog food. Yeah. I, I, so that showed his ability to survive. I saw this and I, I, and I could be wrong, but I believed he it said he was, he was away for school. I could be wrong, but I believe it said he was away for school. And during the, the winter break or whatever, or summer break, he disappeared and showed up like days later. He had made a 500 on foot. Yes. They said he was, he stank and he looked like he had been living on the streets, but he was capable and willing enough to make a 548 mile trip on foot. And that wasn't the first time he, he had shown some resilience. Uh, another time he escaped from a psych facility by squeezing through a drain pipe and making it back to Marysville in his hospital gown. Now, now mind you, both of these instances, he did not have money. He did not have Nothing. resources. He did not have a map. And both times he ended up back in Marysville. He's a fighter. Uh, I heard dog food tastes like toes, though. I mean, I'm just saying. So I think with, you know, that's where I mean, he's going. He probably just had schizophrenia, looked at the toes and was like, that's dog food. And just ate the Listen, toes. these guys are like, listen, Donner Pass. Um, and then one more thing before we get <laughs> into the final, the final theory is I just want to throw this last one out. Unsolved Mysteries. Everybody's seen Unsolved Mysteries for the most part. We used to love watching yeah, Unsolved Mysteries. Yeah. Unsolved Mysteries comes to all the families and like, hey, we want to do a sh an episode on this. And all the families are like, absolutely. Guess whose family said no? Gary's. Uh -huh. Whoa. Gary's, Gary's refused. Yeah. Refused. And well, when, probably because it puts Gary in a bad light. I mean, they probably think well, either Gary's a murderer. Okay. okay, okay they could have said that. They could have said, the, hey, but, we yeah. all agree, you, but you, you need but you to, have to frame you Gary. stand neutral. Yeah. They did. So when this was all going down, they were the ones that said that if he had gone without his medication for too long, that he, would, that he was uh, a candidate for potential havoc, right? I, I use that word crazy havoc. Yeah. His dad used that in the midst of them looking for the bodies or looking for, not the bodies, but looking for the boys. Right. Um, because he had gone too long without his medication. So I would believe based on his history, right? He had, a, he had a history of violence. Um, he also was the, even though he was relatively young for the group, he was 25, right? With 24 to 32. 
um, he had not known the boys as long as everybody else. This is one of the things I saw is that they make them in everything you, you lay out there. They make these boys out as if they were like attached to the hip and all of them had whatever. But it sounded like Gary was like an odd duck out. He was a part of the group, but he was he was different, right? He had a different disability. Um, he had a different personality. He hadn't known all of them as long as they had known each other, right? Because he had come back and he, he had just gotten back into society, essentially, in the last two years. Um, but I had seen this, that he... His family, ha- you know, immediately their mind jumped to worry about the potential of what he could or could couldn't have done uh, in the event that he didn't have his medication. So I 100% believe that they didn't want to do the show because of fear of finding out that he did something, he, you know, like actually drawing interest to the fact that he did something. I think they believe he did. Well, they and, just, you know, they don't know how to respond to it. I mean, and, it, and the evidence would, would line up. I, I guess the only thing that doesn't line up is that, I, you know, other than the one unknown they, the other ones they know died of, you know, you know, weather and, and cold and lack of food. So it, it, it's not, it doesn't point that they were murdered. Well, that is true. So Gary is a man that, that has no problem drinking stolen milk and eating dog food. Now that doesn't rule out Cody's theory of cannibalism. I think if he, these members died of hypothermia, he could still cannibalize them. Yeah, I think he in did order what to he had alive. to do to survive. He was and an so, army man, and we saw he's a survivalist, too. He's a survivalist. He's yeah. a survivalist, so, right? And so one of the, the theories, we're we'll going back around the theories, is I, I, theorizing myself, right? It appears like the two members died, um, Bill and Bill Sterling, and was it Jack Maruga? Yeah. Died on the way to, because it was southeast, right? They were going up into the mountains on the way to the trailer. The three members that made it to the trailer would be Jack Hewitt, Ted, uh, and uh, Gary, right? And the reason we believe Gary did is because of the can opening, right? He's the only one that would have been there of those three men uh, to be able to open the can. Well, uh, Matthias, too, because he's from the Army, too. That's what I meant. Yeah. Gary Matthias. Yeah. He's the only one. The yeah. other, Jack Maruda, M- M- Madruga, which would be the military guy, in my opinion, didn't make the trailer. He died before the trailer. That's, that's my theory, right? Yeah. He died before the trailer of whatever causes. He died before the trailer. The three of them make it to the cabin. Gary's the only one that can open the can of food. He's also, his shoes are there and Jack's boots are gone. Now, Jack's boots would have been taken off probably because they started having pain, frostbite, whatever, or it could be n- m- more uh, nefarious or whatever. But then once, I'm assuming, so we, we talk about 13 weeks. The idea is that they live in the cabin for 13 weeks for whatever reason, but they don't tap into any, any other resources, but they're there for 13 weeks. My thought process is, he gets sick. Maybe he dies or maybe he's about to die and they can see that he's kind of incapacitated. And Gary is like, I'm done. I'm out of here. Or Gary makes the trek on his own. But we do know that Jack Hewitt, also being the lowest IQ member of the team, would follow whoever. He would follow anybody that's kind of a commanding lead on this. So if Gary goes to leave, my understanding is that Jack goes with him. Jack is found two miles north of the cabin. So he doesn't make it very far. And we're talking about in the weather or in the winter. So maybe two miles in this type of weather, like it's a long ways, but he's found dead. But all we find is his clothing and everything with them. They have flashlights and blankets. They believe to come from the trailer. So it Mm -hmm. makes sense that these, that he went after getting this, this material at the cabin. Um, But his bodies are, they say his body is scattered, but yet his clothing is still close to him. Yeah. I mean, so, it's, yeah, it's not all one place. Right. Right. And now there's never talk of any evidence of like a fire or anything like that. Like, we, we can't say that he's like up here roasting arms and legs, right? Um, no, you just eat him real cold. You just eat him raw. Right. But the, the only thing, so it, it, to me, That's it makes so sense. Tough. It makes sense that Gary takes off like he's going to try to go somewhere. Like the, only, the only thing yeah. that doesn't make sense to me is I think they said they, they had to have, have had a map because in order for them to know that the service, the, trailer. The service trailer was there 19 miles away, because they did, they, they, they intentionally walked in that direction to, as far as we can tell, to get to that service trailer. It, it, I think it was under the impression that he was trying to make it to the next town, which was Meadowlands or Meadow, Meadow Town. Or it something. was somewhere that Matthias had been before or had previously known how to get there. Uh, yeah, he knew of the area, but, but the, the assumption was that he thought it was closer than it was. I think it, they said it ended up estimating it was another 21 miles. This is a long way. And he thought it was closer. So maybe they didn't have the map anymore. But I mean, but, what's 21 miles to a guy who walks 400? Right. Know? And then there's nothing to say that he didn't make it there. The only thing I have is once this guy had escaped from prison, or like a, like a, not a prison, but a like mental psychiatric mm-hmm. facility and leaving from Oregon to come down here, both times he bit, ended up back in Marysville. Right. So there's a, the theory is, is that let's say he makes it, he gets back to, to, to Marysville. 
if he had done something he shouldn't have, he's going back to his family. His family doesn't want to do anything to do with unsolved mysteries. Mm-hmm. They kind of shut down in the whole process. Um, I don't know if the fam- what happened with the family. I don't know if they ended up moving or anything like that. But it'd be cu- I'd be curious to say maybe the guy made it mm-hmm. and he dis- was so ashamed that he let his friends well, die. Maybe out there. he's not ashamed. Maybe he came back and he admitted to the fact that he did something because he's a schizophrenic, right? Off his medication. Well, and one more thing. And again, you know, at this point, it's just all hearsay. But uh, a female friend of um, Gary's and maybe this is his wife. I don't know. I just saw that a, a female claimed that weeks, months before this event took place, that he was telling her about these dreams. Yes. Yeah, I saw this. That he was having of men going up into the woods wilderness and, and this is how he was going to die. Yeah. That this he was, was the... that he was going to die. Like they were all going to die. And so he comes forward and says this. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of missing, there's a lot of holes, the truck, where's the truck, you know, um, the truck's now been seen by two different people. Let's see. The truck's um, only important. If you believe Joseph Jones, what it's... about the woman, the woman at the store backed by her uh, boss uh, again, this and... is the next day. So these are, so I, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean back on, and we'll probably have a, an episode, but every time you talk about something like Zodiac, there's always nutcases that come out and say they had a part, they want to be a part of it or be a piece of, of it, right? So the phone call to me is just some nut job, and I say that not with a mental disability, but just some nut job like trying to take credit for oh, it. Oh, no, but I'm talking about the, the, the store clerk. I understand. Yeah, yeah, and, the, and, the, and the boss who both witnessed the truck. But the they witnessed a out. truck, and they assume these boys to be those boys when only two of them come inside. So yeah. that's a lot of speculation with not a lot of founding in it. The only thing that founds that story is the fact that it ties back to Joseph Schoen's story. But Joseph Schoen's story in itself is really, in my opinion, has like less credibility because oh, yeah. the guy is like completely delusional in his story and it changes multiple times. I noticed that he went from, oh, I saw, you know, three men and a, ba- and a, wife and a woman with a baby to later in the story saying two to 12 people. Oh, and that, and that oh, there was a point that. in time where he got back in the car and he was turning the heater on before the gas runs out and he sees men with flashlight. Now, it, the story is kind of up and down as to whether or not he got out and started yelling or if he was doing it from inside the car. So there's all these weird changes in the story. N- mind you, the guy didn't die. He was able to get out of his car and make the trek after having a heart attack miles and makes it to the cabin where he can tell the story. It's it to me. I want to tie it together just because it all happened around the same time. But I, I, you know, maybe he murdered them all and he I, just, you know, <laughs> yeah, maybe it was Joseph. Maybe Joseph just did it all. Ate I, their toes and I, all. I think Matthias being 25 years old, he's gone through some stuff. He's got, you know, he's got schizophrenia. Um, you know, he, I, I think he's, good friends with these guys and i think that they you know the rest of them are all mentally handicapped and they're like hey let's go have this adventure and it sounded great it sounded cool they take off they have they went and saw this great game and they you know somehow he knew about this trailer he's like hey we're gonna go and we're gonna we're gonna camp out and we're gonna you know maybe he like makes it sound like military cool like we're army well, men right and this is like 1978 so keep in mind this isn't too long after you know vietnam so if, if you're if you're into the military and you know and maybe he hypes it up and they go and everything started turning out bad they don't really talk about the iq level of gary now schizophrenia they doesn't don't. doesn't no. mean that you have a a learning disability no right it just means that you have a you have multiple personalities right so there's nothing saying that Gary wasn't a smart individual or a capable individual. And keep in mind, high functioning, these men drove an hour and a half. Was it an hour and a half? Yeah. They drove an hour and a half to go to a basketball game. Now, they're all grown men, but they have disabilities and live with their parents. But they went, un- they didn't go with anybody else other than these group of men. So these are men that, that had the capability of being able to direct themselves. So something caused them to leave the road. <laughs> And theoretically, Gary was married. Did we find anything on that, by the way? Um, I looked it up, and it looks like there's mixed reviews on it, but apparently he was. It, uh, his two, wife's name was Harriet. Two different reviews, or two different reports I read said father-in-law's company. That yeah, he yeah. Father, there, so. There's not a lot of information on it, and my guess is tied to the fact that because his body was never recovered, that it, we're looking at someone that, you know... Hey, was Harriet the woman and the baby that Joseph Stone saw? No, the theory with the with the the baby, and this uh, is I was I know I Cody gave me a look when I was talking about this earlier, but the the theory with the baby is later on the sister of oh I can't remember one of the sisters of the 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 men that died um, theorized that these men had been in a scenario before where they 
they would have a compassionate reaction, meaning that they would be willing to help someone in need. And so the idea was that potentially the truck, the baby, and the and the and the woman were involved in some form of domestic violence at one of the places they stopped to eat or get gas, and that the men jumped in and helped and reacted, and that's why they did what they did. It would explain why they went off on a road that they wouldn't normally go on because they were trying to get away from something to help this woman. But the problem is, there's just no evidence of that. There was no evidence of another car. There's no other. There's no evidence of another truck. Uh, the car gets stuck in the snow. We do know it gets stuck because the 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 sheriff's office says that it looked like the wheels had been spinning before, but not in a way that five grown men couldn't have gotten it out. So they, again, lacking of common sense, it's, it, maybe it leans more to your story. Maybe you're right. Maybe they were going to go up and do this trick. What doesn't make sense to me in that story is multiple times, each family re- uh, taught references how these men have, like part of their disability is they're, they're very rigid, meaning that I have to get to sleep because I've got a basketball game tomorrow. We're going to go to this basketball game, but I have to be home at a certain time because we got a basketball game tomorrow. Or I have work tomorrow. I have this, I have that. So, but the whole, remember, deviation I mean, and schedule had to have been, but they could have been planning this forever. And again, you true. know, if you're a bunch of, if you're a bunch of, you know, men, but you know, mentally you're like boys, you're, you still have the boy, like, I want to go on an adventure. And they could have been planning this because remember, Ted was like, no, I don't need my jacket. I'm good. You know, uh, I, you know, anyway, Hey, that's my thought. My, that's my final thought on this is that I just think that they, they just died in the snow. It was a bunch of boys, men, you know, going to do an adventure and it all went bad. It just did not work out because they're not all there. Um, Oh yeah. One more thing before, uh, close. I just wanted to talk about, did we talk about the, the window in the car and the keys yet? No, well, you did yeah. mention the keys were in the pocket of Jack Maruga. Right. So we know that when the, bo- when the body of Jack Maruga was found, that the keys were found in his pocket. Uh, however, we, we did discuss like a theory where possibly um, Matthias was driving because you were saying that he had, he had this dream right before that he was going to go to the mountains and that's mm-hmm. how he would die. And he's had several dreams of this. So this could be him, you know, making these things come to fruition or whatever. Um, or maybe he demanded the keys from Jack at some point to drive the car because what's what was really out of character was that the that the driver's side window was rolled down all the way and that and Jack Madruga's parents said that was really out of character. Jack Madruga never rolled down his window like that. That was something that he just didn't want to do because he kept the car in really good condition. He never wanted to like have things fly in the car or stuff like that. So there's a theory that Matthias might have been driving that night and had the window rolled down. For whatever reason, um, and was the was the one responsible for taking the wrong turn or taking them up to the mountain area. Um, but uh, I just want to make sure that was. Yeah, the only the only thing that kind of goes against that for me is uh, you're right. Jack Merduga is pretty anal about this car. This is like his pride and joy. Mm-hmm. So I have a hard time believing that he would allow someone else to drive it. Now, maybe they're best friends. Maybe he's OK with it, whatever. He's twice the size of Gary. So if Gary was like going to manhandle him and say, hey, give me your keys, I'm going to drive. I doubt that he would let him, but they may not be physical. And Gary was known for violence. So maybe Madruga is one of those guys that's just like, okay, I can't deal with conflict and Gary can. And so that's what happened. Of course. The, the yeah. last part is if you get stuck in a car, somebody has to be inside it to steer, right? It's cold outside. I'm not leaving the door open. I'm going to crack the window while you guys try to help me get this out. But there's no, we don't see any attempt of them trying to get this out of the thing. Right. So you would crack a window to say you can look outside or yell outside, hey, go ahead and try. But it doesn't appear. We do know that the wheels spin. That's all we know. But it doesn't appear as if anybody was trying to help them get out. So let's assume they all get out because the wrappers around the car, it wasn't just wrappers found inside the car. Wrappers and carton of milk were found on the ground outside the car as well. So theorizing, three or four members got out of the car. Someone stayed in to try to continue to get it out. Right. So basic common sense is, oh, we're going to lighten the load. Now, they probably don't think like that, but let's say that's happened. And one of the images I saw was based on where they found wrappers and stuff, they were loitering outside the car. So let's imagine that someone's sitting in the driver's seat trying to get it out, rolling the window down and going, Am I, you know, did I get out? What is going on? Or he's yelling to the members outside the car, but they never were able to get this thing out. We don't know. Um, the other option is, is that they were hanging out for a minute there because the road had recently been paved or whatever, plowed by a truck. Some people can interpret that as, oh, this is a, a, a commonly traveled road because it's been plowed. That means someone's going to come past, someone's going to come along, and they'll help us out. Uh, but I, I don't know if there's any validity to that. I, 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 I myself have thought, okay, if I got stuck, this, tr- this has been plowed. It means somebody's going to come back through here at some point. This is, this is travel. 
you wouldn't plow a road that doesn't have, you know, traffic. But again, we're all theorizing. Um, I lean more towards the side, not quite as far as Cody with the cannibalism, uh, because there's not a ton of evidence of that. And I, and most cannibal most cannibals, maybe I'm wrong. Most cannibals would want to like cook up the meat, you know, and there's no evidence of that either. But um, I think that dog food and milk, dog food and milk. I don't know that there was anything nefarious happening, right? I think that the idea is that they all tried to make this cabin. Um, I just don't see the logic behind it. But again, these are men that had trouble processing logic and common sense. Um, tried to make it to the cabin, got to the cabin. When one of them died, Gary under, because he's done this type of thing before was like, I'm not going to die here. And he tries to make the trek, and I think Jack goes along. Jack Hewitt goes along with them and, and dies in the process. The question, whether I guess the real question is, we're not going to go into whether or not Gary killed. I think we all have our own. You don't think it happened? I think that there's some founding to maybe Gary was involved in some nefarious activity. I just don't lean that way. Cody tends to seem that he like ate them all. So, uh, did Gary survive? Do you guys think Gary made it to the next town? Do you think he because his body has not been found? This is 1979, right? People, other men, uh, men, people have searched, like ourselves, have gone up there and searched and have theories, and no bones have been found. I mean, a schizophrenic without his medication, it, I, I, don't, I don't know that he survived, just because by now, I mean, you're just, you're not all there. You're having hallucinations. Like, that would have popped up on a radar somewhere. But he made a 548-mile trek, barefooted, eating dog food and water, on, went off medication, back home. So he, yeah, he but is, now, but now the everybody within, you know, hundreds of miles radius is are looking for a schizophrenic. The true, true. You know, like it's he, it's now on the radar. It's now people are looking for it. Back then, when he did that drag, nobody was looking for a, a, that, that, you know, that, that, a dude. That, walking, yeah, that's good. Around. So I don't know. I just think by somebody would have seen him. Somebody would have said something. It's all over the news. You got unsolved mysteries trying to do report, uh, do stuff on it. It's somebody at this point. Is going to be like, oh yeah, we seen this dude eating dog food out of our neighbor's dog the other day. Let's turn it in. You know, nothing, nothing has been said. Crickets. So, so Cody, know. are you the only one that thinks there's something nefarious going on here? I don't know. I don't know about nefarious. Um, I I do think that uh, Matthias uh, survived. Um, but um, I, but where'd he go? Like if he if he survived, why didn't he go home? In the last two scenarios where he had done think, stuff like this, he always ended up back in Marysville. I think that he felt ashamed that he let his friends die, um, and didn't want to face facts with the family. Didn't want to have to go to the family and let tell them that I was there and I watched them die. I think that was too much for him to handle, and he just didn't do that. Decided to and potentially that's else. what caused the psychotic break up in, in the military. Make it home, and they put him in the basement. Well, that was the other theory too, is because they kind of shut off, right? So yeah. maybe, maybe he did. They just stopped I just, to everybody and they were like, nope. I nope. think I looked because of his age and I could be wrong. I'm not doing the math on this, but I believe they said if he was still alive today, he'd be 69. So he's not an, a super, super old gentleman, right? Yeah. Like he'd be 69 today. Yeah. So interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Well, maybe we will never know. Maybe uh, one of his family members on their deathbed will come out and just tell us everything. That would be fantastic. But until then, we may never know. Anyways, guys, <laughs> hey, we thank you. Uh, make sure to subscribe on all of our channels. Follow us, like, downloads. We love you. As always, Twist the World, we're out. Peace out. Later.